Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is March the 2nd in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we come to a pivotal point in the story of the children of Israel, because what we have seen up to this point is that God created Adam and Eve. He placed them in the garden to care for the garden, the animals, and the plants. He commanded them not to partake of the fruit and the tree of life, and yet, under the deception of the serpent, they choose what they wanted to do in hopes of becoming wise and like God rather than following what God had commanded them to do. God cast them out of the garden, and the time on earth for man begins. Now, during the process of being cast out of the garden, God promises that there will come one who will defeat the enemy of man and God. And so Satan immediately goes upon the defense and he has Cain kill Abel, the righteous one. Well, as men began to produce on the earth, in Genesis chapter 6, we are told the sons of God, which every reference in the Bible saying the sons of God is always a reference of the angels. Therefore, we're told that the angels, the fallen angels, had sexual relations with the women of earth. And from them were produced these giants, these Hebrew word Nephilim. Well, man has become so evil upon the earth, and much of this probably has to do with the works of the fallen angels among the men of earth, that God sends a great flood and destroys mankind. However, eight people are saved, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And after a period of a year, they're able to leave the ark, and they once again begin to repopulate the earth. Now, God calls a man from a foreign country, Ur, named Abram. And Abram begins a relationship with God, and throughout the course of his life, God promises Abram that there is going to, from his seed, come one who will be the father of many nations. Well, that promised one is named Isaac. He has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, and those 12 sons become the leaders of the people of Israel, specifically the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, God had also told Abram that although his seed would be the father of many nations, these people would endure a great time of suffering. And so they do in a city called Egypt. And after many years of suffering there, God sends a man by the name of Moses to deliver them and bring them out of Egypt. They leave Egypt, cross the Red Sea on dry ground, wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and they watch the death of their great leader, Moses. Well, upon Moses' death, God appoints a young man by the name of Joshua to lead his people. And Joshua is a great strategist, and even more so, he is a warrior. And so he leads the people through many conquests in hopes of eventually taking the land, which God has called the promised land, and this is where the people of God are to reside. Well, that brings us where we are today. Joshua has died, and in Judges chapter 1, verse 1, it says, After the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanite first to fight against them? And so basically what they're saying is we've lost our leader. He was the one that we looked to to guide us and lead us and tell us what to do. But we don't have him anymore. And so we are in disarray and we don't know what to do. So rather than turn to the things of this world, we're going to turn to the God whom we serve and more importantly, who our great leaders served. And so it appears that the people start out right. 
And God has told them very specifically, when you conquer this land, leave no one alive. Yet in the same chapter in the book of Judges, verse 21, only 20 verses after what we just read, that the people turned to God for answer. In verse 21, it says, the children of Benjamin, Benjamin was one of the tribes of the, of the 12 tribes of Israel. The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Now, you're going to see in the story, this is going to become a huge problem. But it's not only the children of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. Look at verse 27. Neither did Manasseh, another one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor Tanakh, and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor, and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblium, and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo, and her towns. But the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Where we saw Benjamin show lenience to one town, Manasseh is letting everybody survive. Well, let's look on. In verse 28, it says, it came to pass when Israel all the people combined, all 12 tribes combined, when they were strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute, but they did not utterly drive them out. This is a big mistake. Verse 29, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. Ephraim, another one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 30, neither did Zebulon, another of the tribes of Israel, neither did they drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahalal. But the Canaanites dwelt among them, and notice this, became tributaries. Take a moment and look that up in the Hebrew, because it means that they became a burden unto the people of Israel. And not only are they a burden now, but they're going to forever be a burden to the children of Israel, all because they did not obey what God had commanded them. Well, verse 31, neither did Asher, another of the tribes, drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Alab, nor of Oxib, nor of Helba, nor of Aphek, nor of Rahab. I'm, they're letting everyone live. It's almost as if they're purposely defying God. Or could it be their general is gone? They do not have a leader. They're not looking to God as their leader because as so many times with us, so with them, they see God as a, a distant figure, a distant thought, not present with them in the moment. Yet we know that he is present with them in the moment, and he is present with us in the moment. But they've lost their general, and so they don't know how to behave. They don't know what to do. If he gave an order, it was easy for them because they would simply obey his order. But there is no one there giving them orders, so they're just letting everyone live. Well, it says in verse 32, the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. For they did not drive them out either. Neither did Naphtali, another of the twelve tribes, drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath. But he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became tributaries or burdens unto the people of Israel. Well, now, because God is present and he's observing all that is going on, chapter two picks up and says, the angel of the Lord came from Gildal to Bacham and said, I made you to go out of Egypt and I brought you unto the land, which I swear unto your fathers, the promised land. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And I told you, do not make a league. Do not make friendship. Do not make partnership with the inhabitants of the land, for this is going to taint your view in seeing them as your enemy because you have befriended them. What I want you to do is I want you to throw down their altars, destroy their altars, 
But what have you done? You have befriended them. You have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Because you have done this, they will be thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And this is exactly what is going to take place throughout the remainder of the story for the children of Israel. So it's not only that the people alive during this time are going to pay the price for this act of disobedience, but their children and their children and their children, many future generations are going to pay this price. Well, now the people upon hearing this in verse four, they lifted up their voices and they wept aloud. They knew that they were disobedient. They knew that they had not obeyed the Lord. And they knew that when God gave his word, it was final and it was true. And so they wept for what was about to be imparted to them and to their children and their grandchildren. Well, the Lord, understanding that the people need a leader, that brings us into the book of Judges. And what we're going to see is we're going to see 12 judges. It's interesting that there's 12 because there's 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 judges. And if you know your New Testament story, there's 12 disciples. And it is these judges who are to lead and guide the people of Israel. But what you're going to see is many of these judges are evil. But in verse 10 of chapter 2, it says, That generation were gathered unto their fathers, meaning that they all died. But there rose another generation after them who knew not the Lord. Why didn't they know the Lord? Why weren't they passing? Why weren't their fathers and their mothers teaching them about the ways of God? Instructing them from a very early age as to who God is and what he expects of us. But it appears they didn't do that because it says the new generation did not know the Lord. And not only did they not know the Lord, they didn't even know about the works which he had done for Israel. They didn't know the stories how God had delivered his people from Egypt, how he had allowed them to cross the Red Sea. He parted the sea for them. They walked across on dry ground. He cared for them for 40 years. In the world. What are the parents doing? What has occupied their time so much that they're not telling their children of these events? It boggles the mind. Well, because these people did not know the Lord, they didn't know the history of how God had worked among his people. It says in verse 11, the children of Israel, the new generation, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Balaam. Now, Balaam is just another way of saying Baal, the, the, the false god Baal. And it is the worship of this false God that is going to cause many problems throughout the history of the people of Israel. But the children of Israel are not worshiping Jehovah, Yahweh, God, the Almighty, the Most High. They're serving a false God, Balaam. And verse 12 says, they forsook the Lord their God, the God of their fathers, which brought them out of land of Egypt. They followed other gods, the gods of the people that were round about them. Well, that wouldn't have been true if they would have destroyed the altars of these people and drove these people out of the land, killing most of them as God had commanded them to do. But because of their father's disobedience in not destroying these gods and not driving these people out, they become corrupted by the things that the pagan nations around them are doing. And they themselves bowed themselves unto these false gods. And this provoked the Lord to anger. For they had forsook the Lord, and they now served Baal and Ashtaroth another of the false gods, specifically one of the gods from Egypt. And I want you to get the sense of what takes place here in verse 14. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. In other words, they began to be defeated. And through the defeat, the people who had defeated them took everything they owned. And they were sold into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. And the hand of the Lord was against them for the evil they had done. But notice verse 16. Nevertheless, the Lord, God in his compassion and mercy, looks upon his people so broken, so much in anguish, 
and he has compassion upon them. And so he raises up judges among them, which delivered them out of the hands that spoiled them. Yet, although God had raised up these judges and appointed them leaders over the people, they did not hearken unto their judges. They didn't listen to them, but they went a whoring after other gods and they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers had walked in. They're not living obedient unto the Lord, and they're not obeying the commandments of the Lord. And verse 18 is going to give us a summary of what the entire book of Judges is about. The Lord is going to raise up a judge, and the Lord will be with that judge, and that judge will deliver the children of Israel out of the hand of their oppressors. But then in verse 19, once the judge dies, the people are going to return to these false gods, Baal and Ashtaroth and others. They're going to corrupt themselves even more so than the generation that had been before them. And so every generation is getting worse and worse. And then God is going to repeat the cycle. He's going to raise a new judge up. The people will conform to what the judge teaches them. They'll begin to live obedient to the Lord. Then that judge will die and those people will go running back to those false gods. They'll be delivered into oppression because of their disobedience. God will raise the judge up and the cycle is going to continue over and over and over. And so because of this in verse 20, the anger of the Lord is hot against Israel. And he says, because this people continually transgress my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, because they will not hearken unto my voice, I will allow them to be oppressed, to be taken prisoner, and to suffer greatly. And it is through this suffering that I will prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep or not. Well, we're going to close there today, friends, and our next time together, we'll pick up with the first judge, Othniel, which is going to be in chapter three. But there's a couple of lessons that we need to take from this story today. First and more importantly, it seems to be a natural instinct, an inborn desire to have someone, physical someone that we can look to for guidance. And yet it has always been God's design and God's will for us to look to him for our guidance, to look to him for our truth, to look to him for our direction. Because if we look unto men, men are going to fail us. Men are going to let us down. But God is never going to let us down. He is always going to be there for us. He will never fail us. The second thing that we see here in this story is that there is a huge difference between struggling and rebelling. With this people, we see a people of rebellion. It doesn't matter what the Lord tells them, how he works among them. They have rebellious hearts, and they are unwilling to conform to what God has commanded. And although we can see many similarities in their story and our lives, where we have failed the Lord so many times, where we may have turned our back on God and went back into the world in which we were delivered from. Yet I think many of us would confess that we never rebelled against the Lord. We were just struggling to find our way. And I want you to note that difference, friend, because we are in a battle. We are going to suffer wounds. We will carry battle scars with us into the new kingdom. And many of us have been bloodied and left for dead. Yet God has breathed resurrection power back into our lives. And we have got back up on our feet, continued to fight, continued to struggle. And we have made advancement in our journey because truly it is within our hearts a desire to please God. And I want you to be encouraged today and not take on that earthly mindset that, well, if you just keep knocking me down, I'm just going to lay down and give up. No, friend, keep getting up. Keep knocking the dirt off your britches. Regather yourself and continue to fight. Continue to press forward. Continue to trust in God and continue to give him your all, your best. You may have failed a hundred times in the past, but get up and keep fighting. 
Because I promise you, if you will continue to trust the Lord, if you will continue to grow in the Lord, your failures at one time were so close to one another. I mean, the moment you failed and you confessed and repented, it seemed like just a few moments later you failed again. But there's going to come a day where you're going to see your failures become separated further and further apart to where you're going to go literally days, weeks, maybe months without having a failure that you have to go and confess unto the Lord. It is a process, but friends, it is achievable. Jesus wouldn't have commanded us to do something that we were incapable of doing. And Jesus's command was simply be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Now, of course, that doesn't imply without flaw, but it means be mature, be persistent, be consistent in your devotion unto God, just as he is committed and devoted unto you. He will never fail you. Therefore, you strive with everything in your being not to fail him. And so I'll simply leave you with this, friends. When everything around you, everyone around you fails, look unto the God whom you serve. Because friends, he never fails. Hallelujah. Well, I love you. And I'm so thankful again that you're with us today. I hope you're encouraged by what you have been learning through our journey through the Bible so far. And I hope that it's giving you strength for your journey so that you can lay down each night knowing that you have done the best in your power to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as faithfully as you can. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.